What if someone told you that the very first bats flew and hunted in the dark perfectly 47 million years ago? The story of Paleochiroptrix overturns all assumptions about slow step-by-step -step evolution. The fossil of this ancient bat doesn't show a halfway creature learning to fly. Instead, it reveals a predator that already had both wings optimized for maneuverability and ears fine-tuned for hearing ultrasonic waves. How can a 47 million year old bat still show us the outline of its wings, even the strands of its fur? The answer lies in one of the most remarkable fossil sites on Earth, the Messel Pit in Germany. What was once a deep volcanic crater lake became a trap sealing animals and plants in layers of fine sediment. The lower waters of this lake were starved of oxygen, which meant scavengers and bacteria could not reach the bodies that drifted down. Without those agents of decay, entire ecosystems were held in stasis, preserved for tens of millions of years, as if paused mid-moment. Normally the fossil record gives us only bones and teeth. Skin feathers or fur are almost always, always stripped away long before burial. But at Messel, these fragile parts remain. The process created the extraordinary illusion of time collapsing. You can look at Paleochiropteryx and see not just its skeleton, but the microscopically fine membranes of its wings spread on the rock surface like parchment. Imagine pressing a flower between pages and coming back years later to find not only the shape intact, but even remnants of pigment these bats survived in stone with a similar clarity. The setting itself tells its own story. The surrounding region was covered by dense subtropical forest where periodic toxic gas releases from the lake killed animals overhead. When fish turtles or even early primates died suddenly and fell into the water, they joined layers of leaves and insects at the bottom. This cycle of catastrophic die-offs produced a geological library page after page of organisms preserved in uncanny detail. Paleochiropteryx is one of its most striking entries because it is a mammal whose delicate anatomy would normally be lost within days. When scientists examine the wings and fur under microscopes, they see information about lifestyle encoded at the smallest scale. The density and structure of the hair give clues about thermoregulation. The fibers of wing membranes show how blood vessels supported flight details that can't be guessed from bones alone. In many fossil sites, these mysteries remain unsolved. Messel breaks those barriers, giving researchers not just physical outlines, but evidence of behavior and ecology. That creates a paradox. We can gaze at a Paleochiropteryx fossil that looks nearly whole, yet the evolutionary path that shaped it remains uncertain. Science moves in both directions. It offers clarity while raising harder questions. At the very least, Messel has allowed us to glimpse not abstract bones, but the living machinery of flight and sonar. And from those still sediments, the perspective lifts us upward toward the air where its unusual wings once carried it. Modern bats usually take to the air with long, narrow wings stretched between their fingers like sails on a racing boat. Paleochiropteryx, however, carried something different. Its wings were shorter and broader shaped, less for speed and distance and more for steering through obstacles. At first glance, this construction looks inefficient, almost clumsy compared to modern insect hunters that must travel far and fast. But look closer, this wing plan was a feature, not a flaw, and it shaped the way this creature lived in the crowded forests of the Eocene. Compared to today's bats that specialize in catching mid-air prey on open routes, Paleochiropteryx held an advantage of control over raw speed. Its stout rounded wings would have let it push air with sudden bursts lifting or slowing itself within a few wing beats. The trees around the Messel Lake formed a canopy that offered little room for error. A straight flyer might slam into branches, but a broad-winged glider could change direction almost instantly. In this way, the very limitations of its wing shape became a tailored solution to its environment. Natural selection does not favor one style of wing across all times or places. What looks inefficient in one situation can turn into the only workable strategy in another. For Paleochiropteryx, forest conditions turned agility into survival. Long wings might glide better in open skies, but short wings let this animal weave among trunks like a thread slipping through the eye of a needle. When you picture its flight path, don't imagine a hawk soaring across a valley. Think instead of a nimble bird maneuvering among branches where the air is tight and unpredictable. Another piece of evidence lies in its hands. 
Fossils show claws remaining on their fingers, unlike modern bats that have reduced claws to support a pure aerial lifestyle. These hooks suggest that climbing was still an active part of its repertoire. Perhaps after fluttering beneath the canopy, Paleochiropteryx could land on bark, clamber upward, then launch itself again. This dual capacity reveals a stage of bat evolution where the line between arboreal climber and dedicated flyer was still blurred, yet already leaning fully toward the skies. The framework of the wings themselves also points to stability. Over the last 50 million years, bat wings have followed the same architectural plan, elongated finger bones stretched to hold thin membranes. In Paleochiropteryx, this pattern is already fully in place. Studies of developmental biology later showed that elongation of these digits was tied to the activity of the BMPT DEU signaling pathway, which drove cells to grow the hand bones far beyond normal mammal proportions. Even in these ancient bats, that developmental engine had already produced the fundamental blueprint that survives in every bat species alive today. Taken together, these elements reveal not an early incomplete prototype, but an animal perfected for the green labyrinth of its home. If you want a metaphor, think of the choice between machines. One is a fighter jet optimized for speed over oceans. The other is a stunt plane slower, but capable of barrel rolling between obstacles. Paleochiropteryx was the stunt flyer. It wasn't sloppy. It was tuned for dense forest life. Its body already locked into a specialized role millions of years ago. However, the story doesn't end with its distinctive wings because catching an insect under the cover of Eocene darkness required more than just agility in the air. Something inside its head added the final precision tool for a hunter of the night. How do you prove that an animal from 47 million years ago could hear frequencies no human ear is capable of detecting? The fossils of Paleochiropteryx can't play back sound waves or preserve echoes. Yet the bones of the inner ear provide strong evidence. Researchers studying skulls from the Messel pit noticed that these bats had inner ear structures strikingly similar to those of living echolocating bats. The cochlea, the spiral shaped chamber inside the inner ear gives away subtle clues. When its length and proportions are compared to modern species, the differences reveal whether an animal was tuned to ordinary sound ranges or to the ultrasonic domain used for sonar. Paleochiropteryx shows the proportions expected of a bat already capable of high frequency hearing. This insight is critical because sound doesn't fossilize. You cannot recover an echo across tens of millions of years. For that reason, early studies once questioned whether echolocation appeared later after bats had already mastered flight. Skeptics pointed out that we might be reading too much into small anatomical features, but when measurements consistently lined up with modern insect hunting bats, confidence grew. The cochlea in Paleochiropteryx was relatively extended compared to the skull size, a sign of sensitivity to rapid oscillations, exactly what sonar depends on. Other early bat fossils add weight to this conclusion. The genus Viasia, preserved in three dimensions, displays even clearer ear morphology. The inner ear canal shapes show that sophisticated ultrasonic detection existed very early in bat history. The presence of multiple lineages, all sharing traits linked to echolocation, argues against sonar being a later addition. Instead, it suggests that hearing at such refined frequencies was fundamental to survival in forested environments, dense with obstacles and filled with night active insects. Beyond anatomy evidence comes from genetics. Modern bats carry unique versions of auditory genes responsible for detecting high pitched sounds. Remarkably, some of these same genes show similar adaptations in dolphins. Dolphins, of course, are mammals of a completely different environment, yet they also evolved echolocation. This pattern of convergent evolution means that sonar systems in mammals rely on a limited set of genetic solutions. The existence of these pathways supports the idea that once bats became airborne predators, their lineages quickly favored mutations, enhancing ultrasonic range, leading to the advanced auditory toolkit seen even in early forms like Paleochiropteryx. The challenge is connecting invisible waves of sound to visible fossils. In this case, morphology becomes the recording tool. The bony spirals of the ear substitute for a microphone locking in data about what frequencies could be processed. The arrangement of the skull, the spacing between the ears and the shape of resonance chambers 
all provide hints. Taken together, they allow scientists to reconstruct the silent soundtrack of an ancient forest, not through preserved sound, but through structural design coded in bone. This discovery reshapes our understanding, with wings suited for maneuvering through cluttered forest canopies and ears tuned to detect the insects using ultrasonic squeaks, Paleochoropteryx emerges as a fully equipped nocturnal hunter. It no longer appears as a transitional experiment clumsily finding its place. Instead, it represents a lineage already relying on both flight and echolocation. The debate then shifts away from whether early bats had sonar and toward the deeper problem of timing. If Paleochoropteryx could already hear the dark with such precision, we must now ask, did flight come first with hearing as a later refinement or were both innovations born together? Scientists once pictured the first bats as an incomplete stage between small gliding mammals and true flyers, still missing the refinements that define the group today. In that view, you might imagine animals with limited wings suited for short leaps among trees, but no echolocation, or perhaps creatures that had already developed keen ultrasonic hearing, but had not yet mastered powered flight. Paleochoropteryx stands apart from both scenarios. From its first appearance in the fossil record during the Middle Eocene, it shows adaptations for controlled flight together with auditory structures linked to high frequency detection. Rather than looking like a halfway experiment, it adds strong support to the idea that flight and echolocation were already integrated in some early bat lineages. At first glance, the possibility of two complex systems arising together seemed unlikely. Flight requires skeletal restructuring, forearms reshaped into spar, like supports, digits, stretched into elongated struts, membranes, pulled between bones. Echolocation involves changes, no less dramatic, inner ear reorganization, specialized vocal mechanics and neural systems to process rapid echoes. Evolutionary models long assumed such separate challenges would appear one after another, not side by side. Yet the mesal fossils reveal paleochoropteryx equipped with maneuverable wings and cochlea proportioned for ultrasonic hearing, suggesting that in dense forest habitats, selection favored the package as a whole rather than either trait in isolation. Other Eocene bat fossils highlight just how varied early experiments may have been. Onychonycteris, for example, has claws on every finger and limb proportions, better suited to climbing with inner ear structures that may not have supported specialized echolocation. Echonycteris, in contrast, shows extended fingers for active flight and indications of at least partial sonar use. Against this backdrop, Paleochoropteryx fits most closely with those early bats in which both flying ability and ultrasonic sensitivity were already linked reminding us that the early bat radiation was not uniform. Some lineages show single traits emphasized, while others, like Paleochoropteryx, demonstrate that integration happened rapidly in at least part of the group. Parts of modern developmental studies provide a plausible route for how both traits could emerge together. Experiments on bat embryos show that small increases in BMP signaling pathways can elongate digit bones quickly, creating the skeletal structure necessary for wings. At the same time, selection could act on auditory traits with gradual modifications to cochlear length, giving sensitivity to higher frequencies. Taken together, this hints at a genetic and developmental basis for paired changes. Once ecological pressures favored animals that could both fly and hunt in the dark, the underlying biology had mechanisms flexible enough to deliver both shifts in tandem. Ecology clarifies why this integration made sense. During the Middle Eocene, subtropical forests were dense, insect-rich and dim under their canopy. For a small animal gliding or visually guided flight would have been limited. To survive bats needed precise maneuverability and a method of tracking prey without light. Natural selection favoured those lineages that combined broad, low aspect wings with ultrasonic hearing, an arrangement that turned forests filled with obstacles into exploitable hunting grounds. This combination was not just functional, but adaptive. The wings provided agile movement through cluttered spaces, while sonar allowed insects to be detected against a background where vision was unreliable. Comparisons can even be drawn to other lineages where multiple traits evolved together under ecological pressure. 
In dolphins, both streamlined swimming and echolocation developed in early ancestors as solutions to pursuing prey in three-dimensional aquatic environments. That parallel emphasizes a wider evolutionary theme when conditions strongly demand two abilities at once, linked innovations can arise and stabilize quickly rather than forming in slow separate stages. Paleochiropteryx reflects this principle in terrestrial ecosystems tens of millions of years earlier. Seeing Paleochiropteryx in this light shifts perspective. It was not a primitive mammal awkwardly testing the boundaries of flight. It was a predator already shaped into a coherent whole, adapted to its environment through a package of traits acting together. Flight and echolocation were not independent experiments waiting to converge. They were working in concert, at least in part of the Eocene radiation from the very start. This integrated design left a legacy, even though Paleochiropteryx itself vanished its functional blueprint pairing, maneuverable wings with ultrasonic hearing carried forward into the remarkable diversity of bats today. Tracing that blueprint backward reminds us that evolutionary innovations are not always assembled step by step. Sometimes ecology and developmental plasticity drive traits to lock together, early setting the stage for groups that dominate ecosystems long after. And when we look at Paleochiropteryx with that in mind, we see more than an ancient bat. We see an example of how evolution can deliver whole interdependent systems from the start, a theme that prompts us to reconsider what early really means in the fossil record. Research on the Paleochiropteryx fossil from Messel shows that bats could acquire flight and ultrasonic hearing very early in their history by the Middle Eocene. Thanks to the combination of multiple adaptive traits, broad wings with claws, inner ear structures suited for high frequencies, and exceptionally well-preserved specimens, this bat became an extremely effective nocturnal predator. This discovery demonstrates how evolution can create comprehensive and tightly integrated adaptive solutions in specific ecological settings.